Okay, thanks very much for the introduction, kind words. Um, I do have a little longer time, I'm trying not to use it all. Um, but, hola, that's my limit to my Spanish apart from dos versa, por favor. When Harvey launched um, Nature Needs Half at the end of uh, uh, Wild Nine in Merida, I thought, wow, this is a really ambitious project. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice to you know, actually do some work uh, using my skills as a, as a, as a GIS geek um, to explore that uh, possibility? And you know, I, I, I watched, re watched, uh, I reviewed Harvey's video just a few weeks ago in preparation for this, uh, for this talk. And Nature Nudge Needs Half Vision is there, you know, a healthy planet um, and a call to action. And we've heard uh, inspiring words about that already. Again, as a basis for this, I, I, when Vance asked me to talk about, you know, what would the world look like under a Nature Needs Half scenario? Well, I started scratching my head and thinking, well, what's the basis for that? And of course, I went back to the work of Eric Sanderson and his team at uh, Sison and Sidec and decided, well, okay, let's use the human footprint map to look at the areas, the remaining intact areas, give that as, a, as an indicator, and combine that with the um, protected planet database to see which of those areas, similar to what I tried to show you for Europe earlier, are protected versus those which aren't. And so I developed this very basic um, reconnaissance level map um, where I said, okay, where are the top 50% wildest landscapes? And we're talking land here. I didn't have time uh, to work with Greg uh, uh, Alpern's work on uh, human impact in the oceans here, but focused in on the terrestrial landscapes. Um, where are those top 50% wildest areas? And then overlay those with the protected areas network from the Protected Planets database. The gray areas are just those protected on that map, are the protected uh, areas. The colored areas, you can see at the bottom um, from the legend, are in these percentage categories. Now, the reason that those categories are a little bit odd, they're not even, is that the way that the, uh, the human footprint data is constructed, um, you cannot, on an equal area basis, generate some nice even categories from it. But you can get to that 50% level. You've also got to bear in mind as well the projection of this map um, is stretching out the polar regions and the equatorial uh, countries uh, looking smaller than they actually are. So don't try to think of this in terms of absolute areas. This is just an indicative map. And at a global scale, I think you know, we've got a qualified yes, nature needs half is possible. But the critical thing is, and I think this harks back to the things that Russ was saying, it's not just about wilderness and protected landscapes, it's also about the biodiversity, the nature that is contained within those areas, those landscapes. And I think we need to bear that in mind. And going back to um, the World Wilderness Congress in South Africa uh, a few years ago, I had one of my PhD students um, was working on looking at the linkage between biodiversity and wilderness quality. And it's not a thing which scales quite uh, as readily as one might think. At the global scale, that relationship isn't particularly wonderful. Um, we have lots of wilderness areas in fairly low biodiversity areas, the Arctic areas, the Antarctic areas. You know, they're wonderful places, wonderful wilderness areas, but the, the uh, oceans aside, the terrestrial landscapes are actually quite low biodiversity. And what Corona found, Corona Dimond, um, is that the relation kicks in at a more regional level and it's driven by potential evapotranspiration. So the warmer and the wetter the place is, the higher the biodiversity. And of course, the more remote and wild it is, the more intact those ecosystems are. It then starts to fall apart again at a more local level when local human impacts and essentially uh, local drainage patterns start to disrupt the pattern. So at a global scale, I think it's a big yes. It is possible, but just bear in mind that it's not actually directly related to some of those issues about total biodiversity and biodiversity hotspots. Because the next step is to overlay that with those hotspot maps. I then, being a geographer, started thinking about scale. Is this possible to repeat this pattern at individual continental levels? 
And for some continents, yes, again, a qualified, it may be possible to think about nature needs half in a spatial context here. Um, Harvey, at the end of uh, at the, the, two, uh, the Wild Nine Congress, mentioned Quebec's Plan Nord. Um, and you can see Canada there. It's, 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 you know, the potential is really high for a nature needs half landscape. But uh, in the lower 48 US states, then it's, it's quite questionable as to whether that's possible. Putting aside those notions of a, a Yellowstone to Yukon network is a, a possibility there. Again, the other continents we can look at and see, well, certain of those landscapes are overrepresented. Some of them are underrepresented. So the um, Sahara Desert, for example, in Africa, and parts of the Amazon Basin, which you've just again heard of that from, 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 from Russ. Looking at Europe, and we sat here in Salamanca, so Europe is a, fo uh, is a focus for us. It's a tremendously fragmented landscape. And a lot of those coloured areas on those maps are the basis, you know, they're rural landscapes. And so that 50%, is, it's really just, you know, for the bulk of Europe, it's not possible, I don't think. Um, yes, those protected landscapes are there, and you look at Germany, Germany has a very dense protected area network, but a lot of that is, you know, it has human land use in it. So these are not networks, these are not possibilities really built, or built around wilderness, but more about... Um, protection of existing nature. However, you can look at certain areas, and I mentioned before, we do have a very strong latitudinal and altitudinal pattern here. So a country like Iceland, you can look at Iceland as, okay, relatively few of their uh, landscape is protected compared to what could be. So it's easy to see how Iceland could immediately uh, designate um, relatively easy. They do have a wilderness protection system in Iceland, remember. They could easily meet their nature needs half objectives. The UK, where I come from, I've sliced the map there, 50% again, uh, included Ireland in there. I don't see this as a real, uh, as a real proposal. There are too much, there's too much human land use going on in those landscapes, although we do have quite a dense, popular, uh, a, a dense protected area network. So in terms of conclusions, um, and uh, I just must mention Joe. Joe, do you want to stand up? Joe's a master's student at the University of Leeds who's helped me a lot in this work, and he's one of the young people at the conference. Um, is in terms of conclusions, Nature Needs Half, ambitious project, can it be done? It depends on scale. Um, the modifiable aerial unit problem, geek speak here in terms of GIS, is we change the boundaries of places and we impose political boundaries on top of our protected area systems, things change, the patterns change, and certain possibilities become alive. Some of them, you know, it's not really possible. But don't forget, we're living in a world now of transboundary cooperation, so think about it in those terms as well. So at a global scale, I would say a qualified yes. At the continental scale, it depends where you're looking. It's a kind of a yes and a no, and it depends not maybe not so much on the continental scale, really, but also the ecosystems, those biodiversity corridors that Russ was talking about. Country, well, it depends on which country we're looking at. Uh, unfortunately, I can say for a UK purposes, mm, probably not, but other countries in Europe, definitely. So the geography is skewed. The biomes issue that I've just mentioned, that's the challenging thing, I think, here in terms of looking at fragmentation, looking at connectivity, looking at transboundary agreements to reconnect some of these areas which may build us up to the, uh, the target of Nature Needs Half at that continental and global scale. And of course, I can't say this strong enough, and I think we all know this, but I just want to repeat it, population growth. And Russ referred to it, and, uh, and others did, about this, this demand, this growing demand for stuff. We all like stuff, and of course, population growth demands, drives the demand for food, for land and resources, and it remains the principal threat, I think, to wilderness and wild nature. Um, so it's always the elephant in the room uh, at any of these congresses. So I think that's it for me.